Good morning. It is July 3rd, 2022, and we are here for Gettysburg 159 anniversary. And we want to thank you for joining us on this live stream. We are up at the top of the Pennsylvania Monument, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Good first morning. Minnesota this morning. Now, if you've been following along, um, looking at what's happening here in the Gettysburg region for the 159th anniversary, you may have you may know that the Liberty Rifles was recreating the charge of the first Minnesota Regiment yesterday. So on Saturday, and if you're following along, you probably saw our live stream yesterday morning where we got to look at the Liberty Rifles drilling and getting ready for that uh, program that they were doing in the afternoon. And you may have wondered, well, they, they live streamed the drilling. Why didn't they live stream the actual charge? Well, a huge storm came through the area. There are trees down. It's, uh, it's challenging. Um, Chris and I took refuge in the car. Gary had to, I think, cut short the program that he was doing over for the Sacred Trust Talks. But the charge did happen. Uh, we were able to get some pictures. We were able to get some video, which you might see later down the road. Um, but we did not have good internet connection. And we know that it's really frustrating to be trying to watch a live stream video and it's not working. So we are revisiting the first Minnesota this morning. And I'm going to tie it to July 3rd, 1863. Before we jump into the history, though, I want to make sure that you remember that we are looking at your comments and we're going to pick some winners for one of these fabulous t-shirts. So use some creative hashtags. We've already got a lot out there. You guys are making it really hard for me to decide because I'm the one who has to decide. So use some hashtags, do some first Minnesota hashtags uh, and we'll see where it goes. All right, so the first Minnesota regiment is in the first brigade, second division of the second corps when they're here at Gettysburg. But let's back up just a little bit. 1861, April 14th, 1861. This is the day that Fort Sumter is going to surrender in Charleston Harbor. And this is before Lincoln has called for volunteers to defend the Union. On April 14th, the governor of Minnesota volunteers, goes and tells the president, um, that he is willing to raise a regiment for the defense of the Union. So the 1st Minnesota Regiment kind of gets that designation as being one of those first units offered, one of the first recruited. And according to some records, Josias R. King is the first soldier to enlist voluntarily to defend the Union. So lots of firsts with the 1st Minnesota. So they recruit in April 1861. Um, they gather at Fort Snelling, which is in Minnesota. Um, they go through lots of drilling, lots of training. Um, they will end up being a three-year regiment. So they have the men re-muster as a three-year regiment in May 1861. So that means these guys have signed up to serve for three years, so until 1864. The first battle for the first Minnesota is at First Bull Run. Lots of firsts, I warned you. Um, this is July 21st, 1861. They're going to take heavy losses at that battle as well. They're helping to defend Ricketts Battery up on Henry House Hill. They'll fight in other battles on the, in McClellan's Peninsula campaign at Antietam. They're going to go into the West Woods, again, taking heavy losses. When they get here to Gettysburg and they're on the field, they have 262 men in their ranks. Um, they arrive early on the morning of July 2nd, about 540 in the morning, according to one fellow in the regiment. Um, so they've been marching a ways. They get to the Gettysburg area. They're actually going to be further up Cemetery Ridge than where we are at the Pennsylvania Monument or their famous charge field which is behind me. So they're going to spend the day up there and other events are going to be unfolding. Many of you are probably familiar with General Daniel Sickles, commander of the Union Third Corps, and his disastrous decision to move out into the high ground that we now call the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, Devil's Den, those areas. His decision, of course, brings him out, is going to disrupt the Confederate attack lines and 
be part of this massive fighting that happens in the afternoon of July 2nd. Now the third core is collapsing under the weight of these Confederate attacks and on Cemetery Ridge Union generals are looking for troops to send into that fight to help stabilize the lines here on Cemetery Ridge and one of the generals that's very influential in sending troops into the fight is General Winfield Scott Hancock. He's commander of the Union 2nd Corps Army of the Potomac and he, at one point he is looking for a unit to stop the, the advance. He's seeing the Confederates coming through. Maybe you saw Doug Dowd's video yesterday where he's really talking about the Confederate advance. Those Confederates are going to get hit by the first Minnesota. Oops, spoiler alert. But Hancock is looking out into the area. You might be able to see the trees um, behind me a little ways out in the field. Um, that is sometimes called the area of Plum Run. It's a dry run. There's not going to be a lot of water down there at this time of year or 159 years ago. So Wilcox's Alabamians, about 1,600 of them, are coming toward this area. And General Winfield Scott Hancock needs to buy time to get more troops into this area to help bolster the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. So he's going to go to the commander of the 1st Minnesota, whose name is Colonel Coville, and he's going to order him to charge the regiment into these advancing Confederates and literally buy time. Um, the 1st Minnesota has been seeing the fight unfolding with the 3rd Corps. They um, say that sometimes it's obscured by the smoke, but the smoke will sometimes raise and they can see what's happening. According to one soldier, he said, I saw our men fall back. He's talking about the fight out toward the peach orchard, the wheat field, that area. I saw our men fall back, rally and fall back again. I never felt so bad in my life. I thought, sure, the day was gone for us, and I felt I would prefer to die than live and suffer the disgrace and hum humiliation a defeat of our army there would entail on us. And if ever I offered a sincere prayer in my life, it was then that we might be saved from defeat. We all felt bad, but resolved when our chance came to do our best to retrieve the fortunes of the day, hardly expecting to come out of the conflict unharmed. So this is the mentality of the men of the 1st Minnesota when Winfield Scott Hancock comes up to their regiment and orders Colonel Coville to make a desperate charge to buy time to help save the Union line. And there's several versions of the order that Hancock gave them. Perhaps the most famous is he says, do you see those colors gesturing out to the Confederates advancing? And uh, Colonel Coville says yes, and Hancock issues the order, then take them. And the 1st Minnesota is going to begin their charge. And according to one of the soldiers in the ranks, he says, every man realized in an instant that order meant death or wounds to all of us. The sacrifice of a regiment to gain a few minutes time and save the position and probably the battlefield. Every man saw and accepted the necessity for the sacrifice. And so they begin their charge toward the Confederates. And again, in the words of a soldier who participates, he says, comrade after comrade dropped from the ranks, but on the line went. No one took a second look at his fallen companion. We had no time to weep. Huzzah. Realizing their losses, that would come later. But in the moment, they have to get to where the Confederates are Huzzah. along Plum Run, which of course is dry at this time of year. And again, another soldier describes it this way, without a word or a cheer, but with silent, desperate determination, step firmly forward in an unbroken line. When they get down to the area where we see the trees today, they're going to fire some volleys. Um, the Confederates are starting to fall into confusion down there. Again, if you haven't watched Doug Dowd's video talking about the Confederate side of this, be sure to check it out. He goes into more detail about what's happening down there. When the 1st Minnesota begins to fall back from their position, there's another brigade, a full Union brigade, coming to help fill the line, this area that they've helped to clear. And as they begin to draw back together and look at who is still standing, their losses are immense. 82% of the regiment falls dead, wounded, or missing in this battle. This is heavy loss. So if you think about that, out of 100 men, 82 have gone down. The regiment has six, or excuse me, has 262. So 80% of that number is not uh, unscathed in this fight. Among the fallen 
is a soldier named Isaac Taylor. Now, Taylor um, has a brother in the unit. His brother's a sergeant, and they've been together um, in the regiment for a while. In fact, Henry Taylor, the uh, one, he writes about on earlier in the campaign, he meets with his brother Isaac. Isaac makes coffee for him, probably giving him a break from his sergeant duties. Isaac's nickname is Tactics because he, he was always reading tactic books. Now, in this charge at Gettysburg, Isaac Taylor is, is killed, and his brother doesn't know it for a long time. In fact, Henry is going to spend the evening and into the night looking for his brother on the battlefield. It's on the morning of July 3rd that another comrade is going to come to Henry Taylor and tell him, I think I found your brother's body. And Henry Taylor is going to go out into the field indeed find his brother's body and he says in letters that he later writes home that he buried his brother on the morning of July 3rd, 1863 around 10 a.m. It's just before 9.45 right now so uh, about 150 years ago a brother is burying his brother here on this battlefield. Um, he leaves an inscription on a gravestone and he writes about it to the family. He says that he puts his brother's name, his regiment, all of the normal details we would find on a grave marker. And then he says that he carved this or he wrote this bit of poetry. I don't know if he carved it or if he was writing it on wood with a pencil. But this is what he told his family back home in Minnesota. It read, no useless coffin enclosed his breast, nor in sheet nor in shroud we buried him. But he lay like a warrior taking his rest with his shelter tent around him. And it falls to Henry Taylor to write for the last time in his brother Isaac's diary. He has to record that his brother is killed here. It's going to take Henry three days before he writes to his parents to tell him about the family's loss. And in part of that letter, Henry reflects and says, Isaac has not fallen in vain. Tis a glorious death. Better die free than live as slaves. I feel as though I was all alone. And then he signs the letter and his uh, closing is your and my country's Henry. So the men in the first Minnesota, particularly these brothers, they felt that their lives, their sacrifice belonged to the country. And I hope that you're thinking about that, that you're, as we're looking out over these fields, the sacrifice that was made here. Now, the first Minnesota is not done fighting. They've made this fateful charge that has cost them so much on July 2nd, but they're going to fight again on July 3rd. They're going to be part of the Union line that helps to repel what we call Pickett's Charge in the afternoon of July 3rd. And many of the men in the ranks will say that they fought exceptionally hard on July 3rd to take revenge for their fallen comrades of the 2nd. Gary, do you have some more things you'd like to add here? Well, well what do you know? Of course, Sarah. Thanks so much. That was great. We appreciate it. And we've got Minnesota watching right now. We've got a lot of people loving uh, your narrative and people have taken seriously your charge for hashtags. Let me tell you, awesome. we've got a lot on there, but I think I might give some props to one guy named Derek who simply said, can I have one, please? He wants a shirt from Ancestry Fold 3. And thanks so and much. And I like An the politeness. Yes, yes, indeed. You never know how you're going to appeal to Sarah's generosity a few days from now when she goes through all these comments. So we'll see how all that goes. Our friend Taylor Bishop is watching um, and a whole bunch of our other friends are watching. It's so good to see you on here. Now, what have you here? What I want to do is finish up one thing about the first Minnesota, and then, uh, and since Minnesota's here, let me just say Minnesota for you, and then I want to take you around a little bit to the degree possible. Of course, we don't have ac full access to this. We're sharing the Pennsylvania Memorial, erected in 1910 for $182,000 <laughs> with a whole bunch of other people. But uh, we already showed this picture of Patrick uh, and Isaac Taylor, also known as Henry, uh, Patrick Henry Taylor. And this is a beautiful quarter plate tintype. It's a large tintype. And uh, it was in the park in the 1970s and then incredibly went missing. William Frazanito had made a copy of it because it was such a striking full length large uh, tintype. And he did it. Then it went missing for um, just about 20 years until one day I was at the park collecting photos. Incredibly, it was a uh, part of my contract job to help collect all the photos in high resolution for the Gettysburg Museum when it arrived in the mail with an apology to all that uh, this uh, photo, they thought it belonged to the park, they were right, and that they were found in the, uh, among the possessions of a deceased relative. Um, so, uh, you know, apparently, well, I don't want to say too much about the relative. We probably know who that was, but he descended from one of the Taylor brothers um, and felt erroneously that he deserved that particular tintype. 
in any case, uh, you know, what a great story it is. But just because we happen to have a diary and whatnot, we should think of all the soldiers who fell here, who fought here, you know, in a broad sense and use those things for which we do have, uh, you know, accounts, diaries and things like that to better understand the ones for which we don't. Now, Sarah's already kind of covered this area. So let's walk over here, see, see how many people we have over here and uh, if they'll let us talk. Well, we got a clear quadrant, and this is the main one. Now we're looking almost, you know, I would say northwest north a little bit. And by the way, there are helpful things on this monument to help point out everything. We call this nowadays, we call it dumb tech, but dumb tech works. It points directly toward everything and how far away it is, which is really cool. And one of these things would point directly toward the Kadori barn. We'll probably be talking about that later. Toward all the monuments you see here on Cemetery Ridge. If you wanted your monument anywhere at Gettysburg, it's going to be here. <laughs> on Cemetery Ridge. And panning further to the right, you might catch General George Gordon Meade's statue and to its right, Cemetery Hill. If we went over further to the right, oh, you could probably even do that from there, Chris. You can see Culp's Hill and maybe even its tower. Now, don't fall off here, Chris. Uh, we have had two kids fall off this monument, once in the 1970s, once uh, in the early 2020s, and both survived. Could you imagine those parents just shaking their heads at those kids? Happily, they survived despite the hard granite fall here. Please be careful atop the Pennsylvania Memorial, um, if you will. Now, one thing I want to say from here, and this is a little bit personal, but one of my top five most impactful Civil War experiences of all time was during Gettysburg 150. I'm up here on July 3rd when 25,000 people, reenactors and the public alike, were crossing this field. And it was, it, it was incredible. I couldn't take it all in, even from this high height. It was more than a mile wide. There were cannons booming. And then there were people up here who knew that I was a battlefield guide, so I started to explain it until there were 100 people around me and I was narrating Pickett's Charge as it actually occurred. And man, if you have one of those experiences, cherish that experience and write about that experience after you have it so you'll be able to remember it as you did that day, much like we wish the veterans always would have. Um, I think I'm just about done because we've got some pickets charged to cover. We've got a lot of people up here. So um, thanks to Sarah for setting us up so well on the First Minnesota. Thank you all for your hashtags, for your involvement in this particular feed, and for all your support of battlefield preservation and education.